All right, we're going to look at Andrew Marvell's marvelous poem to his coy mistress, uh, the most famous of Marvell's poems, uh, littered across undergraduate syllabi, largely because it is talking about sex. So, of course, it's going to be there in undergraduate syllabi. Um, trying to find something from the 17th century which appeals to modern sensibilities, which are no different than sensibilities of er any other era, one might add. But of course, modern uh, uh, compilers of these anthologies uh, are never uh, too hesitant to try and bring forth these perennial themes that we find throughout literature. Marvell is no different. He is a metaphysical poet like uh, some of the others we have seen. And this, is, this particular poem is an example of a genre called the carpe diem poetry, made famous in uh, that movie with Robin Williams, The Dead Poet Society, which he's sort of whispering in a rather creepy way, carpe diem, seize the day while gather ye rosebuds while ye may. That's a poem we'll, that we, uh, handled earlier on the course. Uh, this is one of the same, but it has complexity about it that I think is usually not recognized. And I hope that I can provide some enlightenment upon here. Uh, it's addressed to his coy mistress, uh, but the form in which it is written and the uh, grammar seems to have escaped many people's that, so I think they simply misread the poem. It is about uh, seduction, of course but there's a little bit more to it than that. Um, and uh, I will explain as I read the poem, why don't I begin by doing precisely that? I will read it. <clears throat> and what we will find is that it falls into three significant sections, which are obviously seen in the uh, indentation here, two and three, three parts. And the three parts are really three movements and three discrete, distinct movements uh, in the poem. The poem is written in iambic tetrameter, and he announces the theme of the poem and the problem of the poem right in the very first line. And it is uh, emphasized by the meter itself. Had we but world enough and time, this coyness, lady, were no crime. We would sit down and think which way to walk and pass our long love's day. Thou by the Indian Ganges side shouldst rubies find. I by the tide of Humber would complain. I would love you 10 years before the flood and you should, if you please refuse till the conversion of the Jews. My vegetable love should grow vaster than empires and more slow. And hundred years should go to praise thine eyes and on thy forehead gaze. Two hundred to adore each breast, but thirty thousand to the rest. An age at least to every part, and the last age should show your heart. For lady, you deserve this state, nor would I love at lower rate. But at my back I always hear time's winged chariot hurrying near. And yonder all before us lie deserts of vast eternity. Thy beauty shall no more be found, nor in thy marble vault shall sound my echoing song. Then worms shall try that long preserved virginity and your quaint honor turn to dust and into ashes all my lust. The grave's a fine and private place, but none I think do there embrace. Now, therefore, while the youthful hue sits on thy skin like morning dew, and while thy willing soul transpires at every pore with instant fires, now let us sport us while we may, and now, like amorous birds of prey, rather at once our time devour than languish in his slow chapped power. Let us roll all our strength and all our sweetness up into one ball, and tear our pleasures with rough strife through the iron gates of life. Thus, though we cannot make our son stand still, yet we will make him run. <clears throat> so this poem, at least ostensibly, is about 
seizing the day. And by seizing the day, um, being uh, amorous, uh, he's seducing his coy mistress. But the poem introduces a problem at the outset of the poem, as I say, introduces it in the very first line. And in some ways it is uh, very ironically done in the same way that we see in the poem we've already looked at, John Donne's The Flea, uh, proposing um, a sexual uh, encounter, but at the same time presenting it in such terms that there are problems introduced. And he, in both cases, the poets recognize the uh, conventions of courtly love and the need to praise their lover and praise them in, according, in accordance with various established conventions, um, referring to uh, the eyes and the lady's forehead, 200 years to adore her breast, 30,000 to the rest, um, uh, issues of, uh, or rather terms of, of plenitude, but also again, stock conventions to praise the, not just the lady, but her parts, uh, which are beauteous to behold and worthy of admiration, if not absolute devotion. And this is what he promises at the outset to her. And his world, if we bear in mind Dunn's use of the microcosm and the sense of a uh, the cosmic perspective, that really is the vantage point taken here at the outset of this poem as well, which encompasses not only his own little world uh, of the Humber, uh, her or uh, Marvell is writing from uh, Hull, uh, the place where William uh, Wilberforce uh, resided a few hundred years later. Um, but and and the Humber River, um, he's on the north bank there. He would be there while she would be by the Indian Ganges side. Now, while he's writing this, the East India Company is. Uh, exploring India and bringing back, among other things, rubies and exotic gems. Uh, gems being, again, the often used subject matter of uh, courtly love poetry. And she, of course, in accordance with courtly love conventions, is coy and reluctant to uh, consent to the amorous advances of the lover, who in this case is Marvell. And we could just see it as a seize the day carpe diem poem, but we would be uh, remiss if we didn't notice the sense of the very first line here. And the very first word is had we but. And the had we but is written in a very particular sense of the verb, which we often don't uh, announce in English and it's rarely used. Um, in English these days, as Marvell is using it here, he's using the optative sense of the verb. It expresses, expresses his wish. However, it's a wish that has no possibility of realization. And the reason that it has no possibility of realization is that they have not world enough or time. Had we but world enough and time, but they do not. And that's the opening gambit of the whole poem. They don't have world nor time. Time is not the only problem here. World is the problem. What is meant by this world, this word world in the first line? I'm just going to put that question on hold here for a moment because time is the dominant concern in the poem. It, it necessitates haste. And we'll see that the... Uh, lineation of the poems uh, and the uh, reflect this, not only that it's written in iambic tetrameter rather than in pentameter, but that the lines often in jam, they are without punctuation at the end of the lines, they run into one into the next. So in the third line, he says, for example, we would sit and think which way to walk. It in jams runs into the next line and pass our long loves day. And likewise, in the uh, fifth line here, thou by the Angie's Indian Ganges side shouldst rubies find. Again, it enjams. This enjambment uh, is characteristic of the whole poem. There's a rush, a hurriedness about the poem. His, it expresses the poet's desire for his beloved, of course, but it also expresses the sense of urgency and the, the 
uh, sense of the importance of time and the lack of time that he has, a sense of his mortality, but perhaps there's a little bit more than the problem of mortality that he views in mind here, but I will get to that when I get to it. But this is what he introduces here, that if we had this time, this coyness were no crime, but because we don't have it, it is. And what would he do had he but world enough in time? Well, then he would. She could go to India. He could stay by the Humber. They could be separated, much as uh, done uh, in his valediction forbidding morning envisages the two of them separated as as if it were by a pair of stiff compasses she he roaming far and she being at home here the roles are reversed she's by the side of the of the ganges and he by the humber separated and he would love you how long would he love you 10 years before the flood the flood of noah and and you should if you please refuse till the conversion of the jews this is a long time. Conversion of the Jews is a reference, uh, a biblical reference. The biblical references are replete in this poem, by the way. Um, often seen the key uh, passage in scripture for this is in Romans 11, 25 and 26, uh, in which uh, the apostle Paul writes, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so that you may not be conceited. Israel is experiencing a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. Now, how is this poem or, or is this verse read and how is it understood? Well, um, some people say that it, uh, Marvell here is referring to the last days. Um, and either um, this, this would hold true whether he was a premillennialist or whether he was a postmillennialist in the case of post-millennialism, which would be um, common in the day in which he's writing under the age of Oliver Cromwell, the post-millennial view is that the conversion of the Jews would bring about the uh, physical return uh, and reign of Christ for a thousand years with the church. And some have cited that uh, and, and mistakenly cited the fact that uh, the Jews were expelled from England, uh, but failed to note that under Oliver Cromwell, they were invited back to England, invited to, in fact, to worship in accordance with their, with their customs and in accordance to their religion, and invited back not just there, but they were invited into Scotland and so forth. So it's not the case that um, it's not going to happen because the Jews aren't even in England, they have been invited back, in fact. So that's the cultural context uh, in terms of that. But at any rate, he's uh, imagining a beginning time, 10 years before the flood, and an end time of this period when she could delay. And during that time, his vegetable love, which many see as a sort of a phallic reference, uh, would grow as slowly as how long? Vaster than empires and more slow. Again, rather humorous <laughs> um, suggestion. And a hundred years would go on and then he would praise her as I suggested earlier on. It would go on for thousands of years. And the last stage would show your heart only then. So he could wait that long because that's how much he loves her. For lady, you deserve this state, nor would I love at lower rate. <laughs> but here's the problem. At my back, I always hear time's winged chariot hurrying near. Here is the problem, which he introduced at the very outset of the poem. He does not have time. Remember, I also said he doesn't have the world, but here he introduces the first poem. He does not have time. He hears time's winged chariot hurrying near, and yonder, all before us lie deserts of vast eternity. That's a strange thing. Time's winged chariot, he has a sense of time, but also a sense of eternity. Eternity is the exact opposite uh, problem that you would have thought um, would trouble him if he is willing to wait this seemingly almost infinite time of 30,000 years. But before us, before he's, us, he sees 
uh, deserts of vast eternity. Now, this is the world he's referring to, a waste, a wilderness. And in the wilderness, beauty is despoiled. It doesn't find its fruition. He's imagining a, a being cast out of the garden. He's in a place where beauty does not find its, uh, its appreciation, where beauty, in fact, decays and dies. References here um, bring to my mind Keats' famous poem, Ode on a Grecian Urn. I suspect that he had read Marvell's uh, poem to his coy mistress here. But he says, deserts where thy beauty shall no more be found in that lengthened time period, nor in thy marble vault, in other words, when you're dead, shall sound my echoing song. Then worms shall try that long preserved virginity and your quaint honor turn to dust and into ashes all my lust. So again, mortality is the problem. The graves are fine in private place, but none, I think, do there embrace. And this necessitates the third movement, which is the imperative, which he feels at the outset. There's not enough time. There's not enough world. This moment needs to be now. And so he says exactly that. Now, therefore, while the youthful hue sits on thy skin like morning dew, and while, my, while thy willing soul transpires at every pore with instant fires, is rather presumptuous of him, but uh, probably talking in uh, terms of uh, uh, empedically strife and flux in uh, terms of uh, pre-Socratic philosophy, Empedocles, who saw these two things as motivating all of life, this, this war and love. Um, <clears throat> now with that these things are happening and the, uh, the chemical world, the physical world is at uh, is pushing towards this. Now let us sport while we may. Not like doves. Doves are the conventional uh, mm -hmm. bird associated with love. Rather, he appeals to a predatory bird, an amorous bird of prey, an eagle perhaps, which will, will seize with its talons in a very, and, and a, as a raptor, grasp with, with its ferocity. Um, let us seize the day. Like amorous birds of prey, rather at once our time devour than languish in his slow chapped power. So let us roll all our strength and all our sweetness up into one ball and tear our pleasures with rough strife through the iron gates of life. Thus, though we cannot make our sun stand still, yet we will make him run. Now, um, done here or done here. Um, Marvell is uh, here speaking here again in terms of eternity, but he has very specific instances of mine in which time did stand still. And specifically, he has in mind the reference in Joshua, Joshua 10, verse 13, when uh, the Lord, when Joshua prayed for victory over the Amorites, and where we read uh, on that day, the Lord gave the Amorites over to the Israelites, and Joshua spoke to the Lord in the presence of Israel and said, O sun, stand still over Gibeon, O moon, over the valley of Ajalon. Uh, and so the sun stood still and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance upon its enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. There has not been, there has been no day like it before or since when the Lord listened to the voice of a man because the Lord fought for Israel. That is the reference here in the conclusion of this poem. Let me share that, just the final lines here so you can see it. Thus, though we cannot make our son sand stand still, yet we will make him run. It employs at least implicitly the idea of the microcosm or and macrocosm because now they're going to make the sun 
work because the sun revolves around them. They are the world. They don't have world enough or time. They are the world. And the sun will revolve around them because they will drive it much as the time's winged chariot driven by Apollo across the sky or Helios, the sun god, god driving it as uh, a chariot. Uh, similarly, he will and they will will drive the time and the world through their actions. So this is a short little analysis of the poem. I think there are things I certainly have left out here, but I think it's sufficient to give you some sense of the uh, imagery here. As I say, it's replete with, with biblical references, which are, I don't want to say cosmetic, but add a sense of time to it in time in God's time, uh, but also uh, uh, adheres to the conventions of the Carpe Diem type of poem. And once again, as I say, it is Marvell's most famous. I hope you enjoyed it while you had world enough and time.